Welcome to The Way. We want to help you connect, grow, and serve. Would you please take out your phones and share The Way's live stream on your Facebook page? Let's make sure that everyone has a chance to be a part of what God is doing at The Way. As we head into the fall, we are launching a lot of ministries, so here are some ways that you can plug in. Starting today, our Charged Up ministry for teens is back. Charged Up is a fun, real talk, interactive small group for teens that will take place every Sunday during the 11 a.m. service. Do you know a teenager that could use a fun and relevant place to grow spiritually? We need you to bring every teen that you know, your niece or nephew, family, friend, or neighbor. They're all welcome to join us as we discover how to follow Jesus and be on fire for Him. To kick off our comeback, we will host a game night Friday, October 4th at 7 p.m. Help us spread the word and help get all the teens in our lives to be a part of Charged Up. Tomorrow night, our men's ministry starts again. Come to the way for football and fellowship. Watch the game and use halftime to grow spiritually. Starts at 7 tomorrow night. Talk to Minister Wayne with any questions that you have. Worship Encounter is this Friday at 7 p.m. Worship Encounter is a time of extended worship and ministry in the Holy Spirit. Come by for a time of refreshing and renewal. And Bible Way's annual women's retreat is this Friday through Sunday in Watsonville. You can also attend for just Saturday. You can get more information and register online at BibleWaysCC.org. Or talk to Mother Loretta if you have questions. And mark your calendars. Chat and Chew is next Sunday. Each fifth Sunday, we gather after 11 a.m. service for lunch and deeper conversation. We will be talking with our live group leaders and digging deeper into our new series, Ties That Bind. Plan to join us after the 11 a.m. service for lunch and fellowship. Showers of Blessings will begin again this fall. Showers of Blessings is our ministry to our houseless loved ones. We are currently gathering sleeping bags. You can donate $10, make a note on your offering envelope or through the app to indicate that the money is for Showers of Blessings, or bring a new or gently used sleeping bag to the church by the first Sunday in October. Thanks for worshiping with us. God bless you. All right, turn with us in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter number eight. We are continuing our walk through our lectionary passages. Amen. And again, I, I, I commission to you uh, the wonderful message that Pat, uh, Minister Wayne preached this morning at our 9 a.m. service about uh, the woman with the issue of blood. It was an amazing, amazing message. And uh, he ran out here so fast, I was going to say, maybe you should preach 11. I could just get my voice back. But uh, I think he's so exhausted, amen. He had to go recharge. Or maybe he's going to the Raider game. I don't know. I don't know why he would be going to watch the Raiders. Uh. But if you want to watch the Niners, somebody say amen. That's, there's a reason. Thank God for all you 49er fans. Amen. Uh, all right, Jeremiah chapter number 8, verse number 4. We're going to read verse number 4 through 10 and verses number 14 through 22. This is, man, the continued passage of the lectionary. The book of Jeremiah is one of uh, the major prophets in, the, in the, the Jewish scriptures. You have all these divisions of the text uh, that uh, have a, a number of foci and, and, and attempting to capture the, the story of God's revelation and covenant made with a people uh, that certainly were chosen not because they were the greatest, but they were chosen specifically uh, because they were the least in the earth. And God said, I'm choosing you so I can be made great through you, some people who are not yet great. Yeah. That God always likes to partner and stand with the underdogs. Uh, the people who have their backs against the walls, as Howard Thurman says, folks who are living uh, on the margins, those who are those counted out. God loves to hang out and partner with those kind of people. You ought to give your neighbor a high five and tell him that sounds like me. Amen. I'm glad God loves to hang out with me. Amen. And, 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 and how many of you know when God uh, gets the victory and brings you over, God wants to keep hanging out with you still? Man, it's, it's amazing that when you get a little bit of something, something, you forget that it was the Lord. 
that brought you through. And then sometimes a uh, little trouble comes and then you kind of get a good memory. It's like, oh yes, the Lord. <laughs> Amen. And the Lord be like, don't trip. I, I, I've been around a little while. I, I've seen how human beings act. And uh, that's why the scripture says that God is slow to anger and quick to love and redemption. And I, who wouldn't want to serve a God like that, right? So the book of Jeremiah, chapter number eight, captures uh, uh, Jeremiah's uh, ministry. It's a 40-year ministry Jeremiah had of just reminding the children of Israel of their covenant responsibilities that they made to God. And because the children of Israel were not able to keep their covenant responsibilities, the scripture, the way Jeremiah and others talk about it, is that God allowed their enemies to overtake them. And they are in the process, particularly here in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah had a number of comrades and mentees uh, that were all kind of capturing the same uh, 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 narrative and history of the children of Israel walking away from their covenant responsibilities. Like God says, I choose you. And then the people say, great, we're glad to be chosen. And so we're going to do these things in order to, to make this relationship uh, meaningful and work. And then after a while, over a several centuries or so, the children of Israel always would break up with God and get back with God and break up with God and get back with God and break up with God and get back with God. Anybody ever been in a relationship like that? You just break up to make up, to break up, to make up, and it's just a lot of drama. Somebody say amen, right? And so, uh, uh, you know, it's fascinating that God's love is everlasting and enduring, so God never gets tired of breaking up and making up with us. But there are moments, and I believe this passage really gives us a fascinating uh, in, inter, uh, or introspection and, 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 and insight into uh, what happens uh, to the people of God when we are experiencing the, the consistent loss of things that we know are life-giving and meaningful to us. And so I'm going to spend a few moments in our sermon kind of talking a little bit about uh, the healing of our soul uh, using one of the old black church uh, songs that uh, have become quite popular over the years drawn from this passage. There is a balm in Gilead. And uh, hopefully we can, we, can, we, can, we can tap into that. So Jeremiah chapter number 8. Verse number four, I uh, think it's on the screen. All right, there it is. Hopefully that's not too small for y'all's eyes. But just trust that we reading it so your ears can capture what your eyes can't see. <laughs> uh, this is God speaking through the prophet, to the prophet, telling the prophet Jeremiah what to say to the children of Israel. Verse number four, tell them this. This is God's message. Do people fall down and not get up or take the wrong road and then just keep going? So why does this people go backward and cheat and just keep on going backward? They stubbornly hold on to their illusions, refuse to change direction. I listened carefully, but heard not as much as a whisper. No one expressed one word of regret. Not a single, I'm sorry, did I hear. God's telling the people a piece of his mind, it seems. They just kept at it, blindly and stupidly banging their heads against a brick wall. Cranes know when it's time to move south for winter, and robins, warblers, and bluebirds know when it's time to come back again. But my people, my people know nothing, not the first thing of God and God's rule. Verse number eight, how can you say we know the score? We're the proud owners of God's revelation. Look where it's gotten you, stuck in illusion. Your religion experts have taken you for a ride. You know it's all, you know, you know it all, will be unmasked 
caught and shown up for what they are. Look at them, they know nothing but God's word. Do you call that knowing? Man, all right, God is uh, a little upset, it seems. God is trying to uh, read the children of Israel and certainly those who are their leaders a bit of his uh, indictment and concern. Let's keep reading. Verse, uh, I believe we're around about, around about verse number uh, 8 or 9 or 10. So why are we sitting here doing nothing, the people say. Let's get organized. Let's go to the big city and at least die fighting. We've gotten God's ultimatum. We're damned if we do, and damned if we don't, damned because of our sin against God. We hope things would turn out for the best, but it didn't happen that way. We were waiting around for healing and terror showed up. From Dan at the northern borders, we hear the hoves of horses, horses galloping, horses kneeing, the ground shudders and quakes. They're going to swallow up the whole country, towns and people alike, fodder for war. Verse number 17, what's more, I'm dispatching poisonous snakes among you, snakes that can't be charmed, snakes that will bite you and kill you. This is God's decree. And so God is in the, on the heels of the children of Israel continuing to fall down at their covenant responsibility. They are attempting to make sense of their enemies that are storming towards the city of Jerusalem, towards the country, and they are all trying to figure out what is going on that our God is not seeming to protect us from our enemies. As I read these passages, I, I began to think a little bit about some of the despair that I hear many of us uh, in the church or in our larger cultural society, uh, kind of asking those same questions with all of the challenges and problems happening in our political spaces, in our institutional spaces, in our kind of global context. It seems as if uh, even with our prayers and even with our actions, there are a number of us, and I'll put myself in that category, who are at times wondering, God, why are our enemies seeming to win? Anybody asked that in the last couple months, maybe a couple years, maybe a couple decades? <laughs> it's just kind of in a persistent place of God, like, what's going on? Well, the prophet then begins to resonate with these concerns. And so if we go down to verse number 18, Jeremiah is now speaking about himself. He says, I drown in grief. I'm heartsick. Oh, listen, please listen. It's the cry of my dear people reverberating through the country. Is God no longer in Zion? Has the king gone away? Can you tell me why they flaunt their plaything gods, their silly imported no gods before me? The crops are in, the summer is over, but for us, nothing has changed. We're still waiting to be rescued. For my dear broken people, I am heartbroken. I weep, seized by grief. Are there no healing ointments in Gilead? Isn't there a doctor in the house? So why can't something be done to heal and save my dear, dear people? This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to spend a few moments uh, talking about there is a bomb in Gilead. And I invite you to bow your heads with me and pray as we uh, ask the passage of scripture and these words to speak to us. God, we thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. We pray that you will bless me as I attempt to preach and teach your word this morning. Lord, may it be uh, 
blessing to the hearers and even to the speaker today. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. All right. Uh, give your neighbor a high five and tell them there is a bomb in Gilead. Tell them that there is a bomb, there is healing, and it's in Gilead. Jeremiah, often called the weeping prophet, the prophet who throughout his 40-year ministry was solely committed to deep intercession for his nation and his people because it appeared that even with constant reminders, they neglected to keep their covenant responsibility with God and their covenant responsibilities with one another. This, this sense of dismay uh, and, and, and sadness was a hallmark of Jeremiah's ministry. And again, it grew out of Jeremiah's keen kind of uh, hand on the pulse of the, the, the children of Israel's inability to keep idolatry, the, the, the worship of non-divine uh, 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 idols, gods, if you will, uh, that their allegiance to the uncreated one, to God, had caused them to create these alternative ways of caring for one another, living out their social responsibilities. And, and, and Jeremiah, because of all of these challenges that he saw, uh, because of his preaching and teaching that seemed to fall on deaf ears, Jeremiah, according to many, uh, was thought to be someone who obviously struggled with all kinds of of emotions that we could describe today as depression. A deep sadness that, 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 that is hard to, to leave and to, 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 to run away from. Just a, 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 a deep kind of, of disappointment and, and loss. Uh, anyone ever had this kind of like hole in your stomach uh, after you've lost someone, it could be a loved one, it could be a job, it could be uh, a boo, it could be, it could be your home, it could be your children uh, not acting right, your marriage is on the rocks, you're sad about uh, how your, your, your physical body just can't seem to get over some of these challenges, and you get this kind of internal uh, just hole in your, in your stomach, and nothing seems to get you over the hump. Anybody ever had that experience before? I was at the doctor earlier this week. It was my annual uh, checkup uh, that I hadn't done in about three years, amen? Uh, <laughs> and, and you know, most of the time, because I'd be flying all the time and I'd be forgetting that I, I have the appointment until I'm like in New York somewhere and then my calendar pops up and be like, you have a 9.30 annual checkup. And I'd be like, well, guess I'm not going to that. Somebody say amen. <laughs> and, and, and so this particular time, I was home because I'm trying to take a little break from all my, my travels for the next few months and, and, and just be, be chill for a little while. And, and, and I happened to be a little under the weather because I have a peanut allergy. And I was uh, in D.C. last week and somebody gave me some pastries and I ate it and, and it, just, it, just, it just wiped me out. I was just thinking, Lord, I felt like a Sanford and Stun. Elizabeth, I'm coming to see you. You know, I just... I was in bad shape. I was popping Benadryl, just trying to get home. And, and so for the whole week, I was just kind of, kind of, uh, just, you know, in and out of consciousness. And so as I went to the doctor to get my checkup, you know, uh, I explained to him what happened. He's like, oh, you'll be okay. You know, just keep drinking water and taking a little Benadryls and sleep. And so I got a lot of that. But as we talked, you know, this was the same doctor who I had talked to uh, a couple years ago right after Trump had won. And he had told me back then that he was having a number of people come, a uh, record number of folks coming into urgent care to see him. And their only symptom was just this deep penetrating anxiety. And it was showing up in their bodies 
uh, through physical manifestation. And so they would think that, you know, they're sick, or they would think that, you know, because I can't sleep, or they would have these pains, and you do all these tests, and then after a while, you know, they start asking you questions, and they started to talk about all of these things that were unhappy about their life or the culture or the, the season they were in. And he told them, you know, there's, 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 there's nothing really wrong with you physically per se. What, what, what you're dealing with is probably sadness, anxiety, and worry. And so we were continuing to talk about that, and I was getting my checkup, and he was just asking me, you know, how you doing, Pastor Mike? And I was like, well, you know, I, Doc, I'm, I'm, I think I'm doing better than uh, normal, but I must admit there are so many crazy things happening in the world, and I am concerned about the heart of our people. And then this passage, you know, was the lectionary passage for the weekend. As I began to, to, to read the passage, I, I then, of course, remembered that this month is Suicide Prevention Month. And how even a couple weeks ago, it was Suicide Prevention Week. And, and because of the work we do with gun violence, I'm acutely aware that uh, the, the, the largest number of deaths caused by guns are suicides. That more than homicides, people taking the life of another person with a gun, that most gun deaths are a result of suicides. And as we dug into the, the data, we find that nearly 800,000 people die of suicide in the world every year. That means one person every 40 seconds. Suicide, listen to this, is the second leading cause of death in the world for those ages between 15 and 24. In the United States, it's the 10th leading cause of death. And it was the second leading cause of death, this was so sad to me, between the ages of 10 and 34. The fourth leading cause of death among individuals between the ages of 35 and 54. It, 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 it helped me to appreciate the depth in which many people in our families, our communities, and dare I say ourselves, because, you know, suicide, suicide attempts and suicide ideation, you know, this, the, these thoughts of, like, the world would be better if I just wasn't here. Or, 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 or this deep sense of sadness that may be clinical or may be uh, a result of mental illness or a need to address mental health. That all of these things compounded together can cause many of us to resonate with the prophet who says in verse number 18, my joy is gone. Grief is upon me and my heart is sick. As I read those words, I began to think of all the counseling sessions I do with folks in our church or folks in the movement or folks on my staff team. And I began to just appreciate that even with all of the things that are happening outside of us, if we don't care for our soul and our spirit, that those outside pressures could combine or coordinate to create such a deep sadness that would cause us to describe ourselves like this prophet. My joy is gone. The grief is upon me and my heart is sick. Yesterday in our leaders meeting, we, we, we were going around the room, some of the leaders here at the way, and, and, and we were just talking about some of the challenges we have of feeling uh, like our relationships are, are tenuous. And, and some were saying, you know, hey, uh, I just feel overwhelmed by, uh, you know, doing too much. You know, I, I'm not in balance. And, and I just always feel like I'm just, just all over the place and I can't get myself still. And we, we read a passage from Psalms where the, the scripture says, that we should cast all of our cares on the Lord. And then there was a great uh, message translation where it said uh, that we should pile all of our troubles on God. 
And we, 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 we only were supposed to have a 15 minute devotion when that thing stayed with us for about 30, 45 minutes. Man, I think all of us sitting around here trying to figure out how can we better lead the church, we started to ask ourselves, how can we better pile all of our troubles onto God? And so I, I, I bring all of this in the room for us today because I want you to know that our following the ways of Jesus also allows us to have access to the resources of our tradition, the Christian tradition that does bring us words and language to help us process through the deep pain and disappointments life will bring. It is not the case that we should come to church and act our way through grief and disappointment. That's my first point, y'all, that one of the things that you and I have to become comfortable with is acknowledging our disappointment with God. I know somebody's like, Pastor Mike up there talking about you disappointed with God. But if we can all tell the truth while we're in church, <laughs> somebody say, man, even if I tell them, we're going to tell the truth while we're in church today, man. There are times where we are disappointed with God. Do I have a witness in the house today? Anybody? Like, like God, I prayed and I fasted. I paid my tithes. You told me to forgive these folk. I forgave them. They keep doing the same thing. You told me to act this way with folks on my job, and they seem to get promotions, and I seem to stay right here. My, my children, you know, God, what's going on with my children? I can't even talk about it no more. My relationships. All of these things that concern me, they produce disappointment with God. And often, we run right past our disappointments with God and attempt to get to the celebration or to the resolution, not realizing that as the text we read today tells us, the people were declaring the harvest is past. The summer is gone, and we still are not saved. I believe that one of the things all of us must begin to be much more serious about, particularly given the time and the season in which we live, is how can we sit with our disappointments we may have with God, those times where we feel like God has let us down. Not so you can become bitter because some of the times we don't process things and we think we're over them until we're not, right? And I think that unresolved disappointments with God lead to cynicism, which can lead to a functional agnosticism where your performance or our performance of religion is not relational any longer. You shut, we shut ourselves off from the deep spiritual practices that are able to rejuvenate the parts of you that no doctor can. Mm -hmm. Amen, amen. See, I, I, I'm one of these people who believe that God and therapy and medicine and, and, and going to the gym and eating, all of that works together. But I know folk who would just be like, you know, I'm not going to do the God thing because, you know, God's let me down so many times. I'm just going to do something else. So I'm going to try all these other things. And I'm not hating on you if you do. But we as the church of God in a world where religion is being weaponized to destroy bodies and minds and hearts, I want us to be people of God who are able to sit with the full gamut of the emotions we feel when God seems to have let us down. Mm -hmm. In the text, they say that we hear the pounding of the horses coming towards our gates. Can you imagine what it must have felt like for you to be 
inside. Like, how many of y'all watch Game of Thrones? Any of y'all watch Game of Thrones? All right, thank God for the Game of Thrones crew. Uh, the rest of y'all, I don't even know uh, what, what else you will watch. How many of y'all, I don't know what else y'all will watch. Uh, uh, Troy, how many of y'all watch Troy? Any of them ancient, where there's castles and there's walls. And you inside the castle and you think that these walls are going to protect you. Then you look out over the wall and you see soldiers as far as you can. And you'd be like, mm, these walls are not going to help me today. <laughs> it ever felt like that? Like, like you did all your defenses. You did everything you, you knew to do. And you looked out over your defenses. You were like, hmm. This thing ain't gonna help me today. It could be on your job, it could be in your marriage, it could be with your kids, you did everything you knew how to do, and then you staring at your enemy, bearing down your throat, and you like, this thing is not gonna help me today. That's how they felt. These are God's chosen people telling God, you are not gonna help me today. What am I to do? Well, in the Christian tradition, there is this, this wonderful uh, 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 group of mystics uh, that, that I fell in love with while I was in seminary. Uh, one, her name was called Teresa of Avila. And she had this whole kind of, kind of uh, series of writings about the dark night of the soul. This process where the follower of Jesus will go through, it, it sounds like a depression, but it's deeper than a depression. It feels like you have spiritually been forsaken. And how that stage could last for years. And I was reading that, I was like, Whoa, I hope I never have to deal with that. Then you realize, man, you know, there are some moments where it feels like my prayers hit the ceiling and come right down to the ground. Very had prayed a prayer like that. God, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying. And then when you get done praying, it's like your prayer request is sitting right there next to you. Like, I thought I, <laughs> thought I gave that to you, Lord. It's just sitting right here. You, you carrying around with you everywhere you go. Teresa of Avila, she, she said it like this. She said, uh, God, if this is how you treat your friends, no wonder you have so few of them. Wow. You want to talk about some disappointment with God. How many of you ever said that to God in a prayer? It's like, God, you know, you just told God a piece of your mind. Ain't that somehow we won't tell God what we think while we praying, but then we'll walk around and be like, I can't stand what God's doing. God, get on my nerves. You know, I wish God. And then you get down and pray, oh, thou who created heaven. <laughs> but there's a whole series of mystics, <clears throat> people who through the course of their spiritual journey had to have some real talk with God and the real talk with God allowed them to tap into a set of practices that revealed another depth of God's mercy and healing and sustaining power that otherwise they never would have engaged there is a spiritual maturation process that I believe God is trying to take many of us through. In this season of despair and trouble, many of us are becoming very aware of what it's like to live in a vulnerable life. Even in America, you know, a lot of us, you know, our, 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 our vulnerabilities are contextual, right? But many of us now are starting to actually wrestle, at least many of us who are aware of the trouble in the land, that you think you're in control of something until like a hurricane lands on your house. Until your child gets into a school and you realize that the adults won't love your child like you do. Or you get into the academy and you realize the academy show sure enough ain't gonna love you. Or you, or you, or you, you in your family reunion, and you realize, Lord, I realize why I moved across the country. <laughs> Somebody say Amen, right? But I do believe that there are practices that help you and I to address 
the dark night of the soul, the seasons of disappointment with God. Some of those practices we have in our tradition are called laments. A lament in the biblical text is when you write out just real talk, your deepest frustrations. And you write it out. Why do you write it out? Because you get it out of your mind. And you put it on paper. And then you read it back out loud. God, I'm upset. Why do you allow my enemies to have the victory over me? Sometimes you got to write it out because you probably wouldn't think to say it. But you lament. You openly lament. Confession is another one. Finding people who are, are able to handle your confession of disappointment as it relates to God. A spiritual director, hopefully a small group leader, or a pastor, or one of the ministers, that you enter into a relationship of confession. So you can confess your challenges. Rather than just sitting there isolated and having the conversation in your head. Because how many know some of us, we have so much internal conversation that we can't have no external goods. Amen. I'm, I, I, I can get caught in my internal, internal conversation. Just be like, mm. and you know, I'd be, any Star Trek people in here, y'all remember Data? When Data's processing stuff, he just, he just, he just, he just, just internally, you just talking to yourself. <laughs> then you go to sleep. Somebody say amen. Somebody else do a puff, puff, pass. Or do, you know, I got I to gotta silence what's going on. Rather than you using the practice of confession. It's all right for you to confess your faults and your disappointments with one another. Getting those things out of your mind takes some of the hold it could have on your spirit and your soul. <laughs> Prayer. Prayer is always a good practice because it helps you to stay in communication with God and listen for God. Worship. Great practice. We worship God even when we don't believe or feel like what we're saying is true. Hello, somebody. Because God's goodness is not contingent upon us believing so. God's power. We worship because worship is like a, it's like a transporting system. It takes you from where you are. We talked about, we were singing about this earlier. What was the words, words of the song? A king of glory, fill this place. Just want to be with you. You may not even believe that, but I bet you said it enough times. You may get catapulted next to the presence of God. You may get more proximal to that which you need but don't know you need. Anybody ever, ever got something from God and you didn't know you needed it until you got it? I mean, you, you, you praying, Lord, give me, give me this, give me this. And God says, no, I'm going to give you that. And you be like, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> That's what the scripture says. The scripture says that our spirit prays for us in ways that we don't even know we need prayer. So the practice of praise and prayer and worship, they are practices that do things for you that you don't even know you need done. And so if you're disappointed with God, don't suppress it. Don't deny it. Sit in it. Sit in that disappointment. Process it. Trust your tradition. Trust the practices that have brought a, a countless sea of faces. You mean talk about uh, Hebrews chapter 12, the great cloud of witnesses. I guarantee you folk in that cloud were disappointed, but they allowed the practices to get them through their disappointment. Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm talking too long. So what's the first question? What's the first question? 
Go, go to the next question because I, I don't remember. Do you, no, do yes. <laughs> do you feel let down by God? What practices can you employ to help process those disappointments with God and others who have let you down? I, 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 I want to submit to you that disappointment with God does not negate your faith. It does not put your relationship with God in jeopardy. God is not as insecure as you and I are. <laughs> Hello, somebody. God can handle your disappointment. Carl Bart, matter of fact, he says that doubt is the confirmation of faith. Because you don't doubt things you don't already believe. Man, I, if, if, if I sat down in that chair, I expect that chair to hold me unless... It starts wobbling. Then doubt sets in. But me sitting down there was a confirmation of what I already believe. So don't let your disappointments with God drive you to a place that is unnecessary. Sit in it. Because God is sitting there with you walking with you all the way through your disappointments. Uh, pat yourself on the chest and say, I need to sit with my disappointments with God. I need to sit. The second thing that, 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 that I think the text lifts up for us, if we're talking about the balm that we find in Gilead, and I want to be explicit that the balm, the healing that we're going to find, will come from you processing your disappointments with God. Healing follows that process. Y'all follow me on that? Everybody say that. Healing follows the process. Say it again. Healing follows the process. The second thing that I think the scripture lifts up for us is that we must, listen, cultivate empathy and belonging with the hurting. Empathy and belonging with the hurting. Here this prophet is very clear that after all he is seeing, 40 years of ministry and trying to get folk to listen, the prophet could have been like Jonah. Y'all know the story of Jonah? Jonah was trying to intercede on behalf of people and he was running and he didn't want to do it. And when the people ended up turning, Jonah got mad, got an attitude, right? That's not Jeremiah's response. Jeremiah never got mad to the point where he prayed for the consequences that some people rightly deserve. Now, I, I, I'm, 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 I, this is where I am right now. I need God to help me because I be praying for my enemy's demise. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I do. I, 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 I be looking for scripture. <laughs> God let the blood from the dirt, the heads just roll down the rocks. And, and I be like, see? See? That, 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 that's that, that, that's I, I be there sometimes. Anybody else be there sometimes? You, you be like, I don't need to be praying. I don't need no scripture to pray for my enemy demise. <laughs> so I don't even need the word of God to help me with that. Amen. I, I got enough internal words. Somebody say amen. <laughs> but, you know, me, because I be trying to be sanctified, I, I, be, I be looking for the Lord to co-sign. <laughs> God, I know you. Okay, thank you. At least it's in the book. It is just, just, just out there. Amen. But God, I think, in this season is trying to help some of us wrestle with how do we expand empathy and belonging, not just for our enemies, but for those who are the most vulnerable because of the powerful's wickedness. I was doing an interview uh, for some somebody, uh, uh, Vox or so, so I think it was called Vox. They doing a series on reparations. They were asking me, you know, why 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 do you believe uh, reparations needs to be a thing for um, 
you know, black folks in this country. And I said, well, I think that reparations uh, is, is the way that America pays the debt that it's owed to both enslaved Africans and their descendants and those who are assumed to be descended from Afri Afri enslaved Africans. Because there has been a system of racial hierarchy and white supremacy that has in many ways locked people out of full opportunity and inclusion in creation that, listen, colonizers do not own. There's a myth that we own the earth. We don't own the earth. I mean, you can't make the earth do nothing. I wish I could talk to somebody. That means you don't own it. If you can't make it do nothing, you don't own it. You, you and I, if a tidal wave hit that bay ocean and start coming this way, none of us could make it stop. I know some of us got the force and stuff, and you think that you can just put your hand out there, and, that, and I'm going to run while you practicing that. Somebody say amen. <laughs> if, if, you, if you can't control it, you don't own it. You can't control another human body. You don't own it. That's not what you're called to do. You can't control the earth. You don't own it. All of it has been given to us as a gift, and we are called to responsibly steward it with justice and mercy and goodness and fairness. And this country has failed to do so because it's failed to do so, and it is still failing to do so until we can repair the harm. We do reparations. They were like, wow. It's like, oh yeah, you know, you just give me a few more minutes, I, I, I'll tell you a few more things. <laughs> but the point is that we are unable to show empathy because we don't believe people deserve goodness. We think they deserve their condition. And God is always reminding us that the more proximal you get to people, the more you begin to see that much of what you were told about them is not true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bell Hooks, she says it like this, dominator culture has tried to keep us all afraid, to make us choose safety instead of risk, sameness instead of diversity, moving through that fear, Finding out what connects us, reveling in our differences, this is the process that brings us closer, that gives us a world of shared values, of meaningful community. Bell Hooks, super dope, spiritual, you know, I, I, I love Bell Hooks. An another, another one of my heroes, Martin Luther King, he says it even more plainly. I choose to identify with the underprivileged. I choose to identify with the poor. I choose to give my life for the hungry. I choose to give my life for those who have been left out of the sunlight of opportunity. This is the way I'm going. If it means suffering a little bit, I'm going that way. If it means sacrificing, I'm going that way. If it means dying for them, I'm going that way because I heard a voice saying, do something for others. You and I, in a time where scarcity is being proclaimed from the highest offices of the land, Every place where you and I work, systems are always talking about not having enough. Even in my justice spaces, we are constantly being pitted against one another. In our church, we're constantly being pitted against one another. And you and I have to practice how do we expand our capacity to empathize with those who are left out of opportunity. How do you and I 
figure out more ways to appreciate that the powerful, the systems of this world that are anti-Christ, anti the ways of Jesus, anti the ways of God's original intent are constantly trying to seduce us to participate in their project versus the project of God who says that he wants the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. That we got a job to do. Tell your neighbor, we got a job to do. We got a job to do. Our job is to figure out how do I learn to love more deeply and 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 and, and participate in the places where where the healing of the nations and of the hurt and of the harm it becomes the primary mode of my existence. You may say, Pastor, I don't know how to do that. I work in the academy. I work in the school system. I work oh, 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 in a nonprofit. I'm not out there on the streets listen everywhere you go somebody is looking for some empathy some expanded sense of belonging you could be working on a blue collar job or a white collar job but somebody needs you to tell them that they have been created in the image of God and there's something beautiful and magnanimous and and hopeful about them that even though the world will try to diminish them you're there to blow them back up even though the world will try to tell them why they can't you're there to tell them why they can the world is trying to tell them that they've been disqualified but God is trying to use you to tell them that they have what it takes to do what God has called them to do child of God we must get on our job and move in ways that expand. I want people to believe every time you walk in a room, you are an ambassador of belonging. You are an ambassador of where God knows that you have been called for such a time as this. You are somebody that knows and believes that if nobody else in here is gonna be a lover, I'm gonna be somebody who exudes love, who exudes healing, who exudes possibility. God help us. To be like Jeremiah, that when others are weeping, I'm not sitting there laughing, but I am connecting. I'm able to be with folk who are hurting. I'm able to identify with them. I may not have their exact struggle. We work with people out here that have shot folk. People ask me all these crazy questions about what McBride, they deserve this. I said, let me tell you something. If all of us got what we deserved, I wish I could talk to somebody in here. I'm not talking about even the things that you would never get caught doing. I'm talking about the stuff you got caught doing. I'm talking about the stuff you will get caught doing. But your money and your privilege and your relationships and your connections allowed you to slide through. So I, I can't condemn nobody. I'm willing to walk with them if they get caught or not. Because there's another kind of sentence that sin brings that no one can escape. But God gives us the strength to not allow that to destroy us. Somebody say amen about that, right? So my prayer for all my loved ones and all of us, and I, I got to wrap up, I, even though I got one more point about our healing. Maybe I, I'll wrap up with the healing point because I don't, I don't want to leave this too open-ended. There is a bomb in Gilead. There is healing for our soul, and it is not as far off from you or I as we think. Jeremiah asked the right question. And that's, that's how healing will likely be unleashed in our lives. Many of us ask the wrong questions. And those questions divert us away from our healing. Jeremiah says, is there no balm in Gilead? Where's the doctor? Jeremiah knows the answers to these questions. 
But he's asking the question so we all can ask ourselves, why aren't we doing what is within our power to do? The bomb in Gilead was a medicinal tree uh, ointment that although it was readily able to be found, it was limited for elites and others who had resources, kind of like healthcare and all these other things today. You know, medicines, that in order for you to have access to certain medicine, it has to be regulated by all these pharmaceutical companies and all these legal uh, laws and, 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 and not realizing that, that, that none of this belongs to anybody, right? And so the question we have to ask ourselves is why are we not healed when God has put healing within us, around us? Healing is unleashed when justice is done, when fairness is done. Healing seeps out of the tree when we rightly set our systems in relation to our people. And so Jeremiah is, is, is raising this rhetorical question, is there not a bomb in Gilead? God is challenging the people. I've given you what you need in order for healing to happen. Why aren't you being healed? And it's a question for many of us. Why am I missing my doctor's appointments? How can I be so busy that I miss out on an appointment for my good? Obviously, my priorities are misplaced, right? How is it that all of us in this room, with all the wisdom and knowledge and connections we have, cannot figure out a way to make the most wealthiest region in this country house people who are living outside in tents. Who's gonna come do it if not us? I say to me, the elected officials all the time, I tell them, you know, the worst conditions in the Bay Area is not because of the Tea Party, not because of Donald Trump, it's because of y'all. Y'all the ones in charge, oh, Pastor Mike, I don't have the power. How you don't have the power, you the mayor? How you don't have the problem power in you the police chief? How you don't have the problem power in you the sheriff? Who, who's your boss? <laughs> but ain't it somehow we have healing within our grass, it's around us, and we allow people to make us think we don't know where our healing will come from. It is here for us. There's a bomb in Gilead. There's a doctor in the house. There's help. There's possibility. It's, it's, it's for us. Collectively. As a people, as a church, as a city, as a region, as a country, as the world. To not look elsewhere. But keep looking to the God of all creation who has given us all we need of one another, to unleash justice and fairness and hope and peace and to take care of ourselves. I told our leaders yesterday that rather than us being in control, let's be good stewards. When I get into a car, I'm not trying necessarily to control the car. I'm just trying to steward it in the right direction. Because I can't control no car. If the car decides to break down, it's broke down. I don't know what to do with no broke down car. We take it to the shop. One of my cars has been in the shop for four months. I don't think they know what to do with the car. <laughs> but when it's working, it's my job to steward it. Stand to your feet, everyone. And let's, 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 let's take a few moments to ask God to give us a consciousness of the bomb in Gilead, the healing that is within our grasp. Grab the hand of the person next to you and just thank God right now that they may be the first touch of healing, the healing possibility. 
They may be the first person God has given to you where you can see that even your worst moments and your worst conditions are not there to crush you, to cause you to fall into deep sadness and depression, but they are a living, breathing testimony that God has brought them through. Because God has brought them through, God can bring you through. So pray for them like someone has prayed for you. Pray that they would see the power of God at work in their life in ways that are undeniable. Pray that if they are sitting with disappointments with God, that things that they thought would go a certain way did not end up that way. Pray that they would allow that disappointment with God to be a pathway and a journey into a whole nother depth of relationship and revelation. Pray that they would expand their empathy and their ability to be proximal, to, ex to expand belonging. Pray that they would ask the right questions so healing can be unleashed in their life. Ask God to do it for them right now. Before you get to pray for yourself, just pray for them. God, I pray that you would give them what they need to make it through this season. I pray, God, that the lies that have been told, the untruths that have been uttered, the challenges that have been placed before them, God, I pray that even right now, you would unleash what is necessary for their victory and power. Bless their family, pray for their family. Bless their children. Bless their job and their environment, their their, their, their positioning in their companies and in their, their systems, in their schools and pray that they will see that you have so much more for them than the, the, the concern and the worry that these places produce. I pray God that you will give peace and joy and abundance to them. Do it in the name of Jesus. Lift those hands right where you're standing. It's me, oh Lord, I stand in the need of prayer. It is not my mother or my father. It's not my sister or my brother. But it's me, oh Lord, and I need you. Somebody say, I need you, Lord. Say it again, I need you, Lord. Say it again, I need you, Lord. I need you, God, to remind me that you are in control of my life. You are in control of our lives. You are in control of all these things that concern me. That you have a path that you have ordered for me, and there is nothing that will move me off of this path. Even when I hear my enemies approaching me and I don't see how a way is going to be made, I pray, God, that in the dark night of the soul, Lord, that the practices that I have sustained so many will be sustaining for me. May I worship you, God, even when I don't feel like it may i pray and seek your face may i confess lord god and 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 lament may i do the things that are able to help me sit in the place where i know i need to hear you lord may i also relate to the suffering and relate to those on the margins god in ways that bring life and bring hope and bring strength and i pray god that you will help Help me, Lord God, to be honest about the healing that is within my ability to steward. May I take care of myself and those things around me. May I visit my doctors and may I take advantage of the therapy and May I change my eating habits and my workout habits and all these things, Lord God, that I use to soothe myself. Lord, may I rely, Lord God, on the disciplines of healing so I can be made well and be made whole. And I know that you're able to do it. Somebody say, I know you're able, God. Say it again, I know you're able, God. 
Say it again. I know you are able, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Hug two or three people and tell them there is a bomb in Gilead. Tell them that there is a bomb. There is a bomb. There is a bomb.